Father in heaven, we come before you today. Lord, may we take your words to our heart. May we realize that you are the potter and we are simply the correct clay. We are your created masterpiece and you are transforming us into the image of Jesus if we have believed in his message, if we have decided to become his disciples and follow after him. And Father, we thank you for your faithfulness, it's your, your love that surpasses all understanding. How a God as great and marvelous as you would choose to lovish, lovingly, lavishly pour himself out even unto death to save his creation. Father, thank you. We praise you. Open our hearts and minds as we study your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So I hope that video helped a little bit. And I always like to look at it from a child's perspective. Because when you do, and Jesus said, you know, suffer the little children to come unto me. And the kingdom of heaven is for such as these. When you get that perspective, you realize, oh yeah, <laughs> it's not that hard when I give up myself and realize that a simple con concept that God is the potter. I am the clay. I don't have any part in what he does except willingly letting him do it through me. So I entitled this message called The Potter's House. And I want to start out this way and ask you, who are you? I don't mean your name. I don't mean your occupation. I mean, who are you? You're a created being. We look at creation out there. We see the trees. We see the stars. We see whatever things that we see, the animals, all the beauty of life and complexity and everything. We see organization. We see a creator. How anyone could ever believe that it just happened is just ludicrous because creation itself screams out and cries, there is a creator. So why was I created? What's my purpose why am I here? What is my purpose in relationship to the one who created me? Not even thinking about redemption or anything else. Just the fact that I was created, given the life that I was given, put into the family that I was given, the place that I'm at, this time in history, thinking about who God is and reading the scriptures through, and I need to be spurred. I'm behind about a week, Terry. Don't let me get behind any further. It's been time, but we're here to, stud, to study God's word, to carry out his plan on earth, to be his creation. He is the potter forming us. Do you realize that? Do you realize that you are His created being? And then let's throw in redemption. That God became flesh and blood and lived among us. The Word became flesh. The image of Christ, or the image of God, His Son. So that through Him we could read about Him, see Him, and see God the Father. To see His love. And then when He left, He didn't orphan us. He sent the Spirit to abide in us, to make us royal priests, to seal us, to empower us, to pray when we don't even know what to pray for, to bring us peace that surpasses all understanding, as Jacob talked of, to bring us joy so that our joy might be complete, to give us a hope that is confident for on that day when Jesus Christ returns that we will be part of His flock. How much more does that make me into a creation that God wants me to be? That he took the clay, and when it was marred, as the passage says, he started over with me. He wouldn't throw me away. He lovingly poured his time into me, creating me into the image of his Son by molding me with his hands. Scripture says that in my mother's womb, God was forming me, and He never takes His hands off of me. Wow, that's who I am. So who is God? That He would love His creation like this. That we are the pinnacle of His creation, given all of this freedom and responsibility. That we can easily choose for ourselves my will over His will. But should the clay do that to the potter? Should the created being ever challenge the creator? 
On top of that, if we lived a life the way the Creator designed, wouldn't we be living the way we were designed? Wouldn't the things that we really that really bring us joy, wouldn't we be receiving those? Wouldn't the potter continue to lavishly create his masterpiece? Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 say, For by grace are you saved through faith, and not of works of righteousness. But then it goes on to say that we are God's handiwork, or what that means is creation. But it doesn't mean just creation. It means a beautiful work of art, a masterpiece. That God is creating us into something far more than we could ever imagine. That He is creating us into sons and daughters of the Most High. Wow that He would love us that much. And God is faithful as we're reading through Isaiah and Jeremiah and everything else. We see all the things that they continue to do. And we shouldn't point our fingers at them. It should remind us that all the things that we continue to do. Because I think I'm in control of all things. I think I want what I want done. I want the things that please me even though I know that the Creator knows exactly what I need in every time, in every circumstance. God is in complete sovereign control and He will use His creation whether His creation goes along with Him or not. I'd rather be carved into a masterpiece that is willingly used by Him than be made into something else that's still going to be used by him. Think about Pharaoh. Think about Judas. They were still used by God in a mighty way, but they did not know God intimately. They will not spend eternity in heaven with their Father who loves them so much. Can you believe that God would ever choose to save you? <laughs> You rebelled against Him. You're a faulty creation. Yes, every one of us. Deserving to be thrown into the garbage dump. And that came to Jeremiah, that prophecy did. That He told the people that they would be, their bodies would be littered in the dump. And that the animals would feed upon them. Even the kings, the powers of this world. It didn't matter who you think you are. You would be laid out in the dump. I don't want that. I want to be that well done, my good and faithful servant. I want to be that creation that He uses that is beautiful in His eyes and cherished by Him. Beloved, I know that I am because He would give His Son's life for me. Man, I can't believe that He would save me, but I know that it's the truth. I know it without a shadow of a doubt that God loves me so much. So whenever I'm sitting in my poor pity pot... I sit there and think, God loves me. Get out of that mud! It's time to let Him create me and mold me even more. Is that tough sometimes? Yep, it is. But I know that I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. Even if I'm sitting in a prison cell writing letters that will later become the words that we're reading today, I know that I can do all things through Christ that gives me strength. I am a new creation. Jesus said, unless a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of heaven, let alone enter it. He's talking to Nicodemus, the one who should know all the things of this word, that he should know all the ways of righteousness, and probably even thought that he did most of them. But by God's glorious standard, we all fall short and we all deserve death. But because He is rich in mercy and love and grace, He sent His Son to die for us. That's what we're talking about when we see this example of a potter and a clay. And we realize that we are a new creation. He has started over making all things new if we, in fact, believe in Jesus Christ. That means that we die to our old self. Behold, all things become new. We're not that creation anymore. We're not that marred piece of clay. We are a beautiful masterpiece in working process. So I ask you first, are you born again? Because if you're not, you'll never see the kingdom of heaven. You won't have that confident hope 
that day will come and Jesus will separate the sheep from the goats. And no matter how much you think you're a sheep, if you're a goat, you're still a goat. My dog lives in my garage most of the time. And I don't get to see him much at all. He's not an automobile. He might think that he is. Probably thinks he's a four-wheeler because there's four-wheelers in there. But he's a dog. I am God's creation and I am a sheep because I have been cleansed by the blood of the Lamb. And I keep trying to die to myself so that I can live for Him. So that on that day I know without a shadow of a doubt I'll be brought into His fold. So it reminds me of Scripture from Romans 8 when Paul is writing to the church in Romans and telling them this. And I've got this from the Common English Bible to make it simple again like we did this. And look for a pattern here. There's one pattern here that is so, well, a couple patterns, but one that points to me so much in this Scripture. And see if you, you hear it, because you know, it will repeat itself many times. Starting in verse 1. So now there isn't any condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. None whatsoever. The law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and death. Death has no sting, no power over you. Satan can't make you do anything, neither can anyone else. Okay? Verse 3, God has done what was impossible for the law since it was weak because of, I'm going to give you a hint here, selfishness. Okay? okay watch for this. God condemned sin in the body by sending His own Son to deal with sin in the same body as humans who are controlled by sin. He did this so that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us. Now the way we lived is based, based on the Spirit. Now it is. We live by the Spirit, not by fleshly desires, not by selfish desires. Okay, let's read on. Not based on selfishness. Verse 5, people whose lives are based on selfishness think about selfish things. Are you seeing a pattern here? But people whose lives are based on the Spirit think about things that are related to the Spirit. They think about the potter rather than the clay. <laughs> the attitude that comes from selfishness leads to death. But the attitude that comes from the Spirit leads to life and peace. So the, the attitude that comes from selfishness is hostile to God. It doesn't submit to God's laws because it can't. People who are self-centered aren't able to please God. But you aren't self-centered. Instead, you are in the Spirit if, in fact, God's Spirit lives in you. If anyone doesn't have the Spirit of Christ, they do not belong to, them, to Him. If Christ is in you, the Spirit is your life because of God's righteousness. But the body is dead because of sin. If the spirit of the one who raised Jesus from the dead lives in you, the one who raised Christ from the dead will give life to your human bodies also through his spirit that lives in you. So then, brothers and sisters, we have an obligation. We are whatever the potter makes us to be, to be used by the potter to bring him glory and honor. His will be done instead of ours. We have an obligation, but it's not an obligation to ourselves. To live our lives on the basis of what? Selfishness. Hmm. If you live on the basis of selfishness, you are going to die. Not physical death, eternal death. Perishing in a place never meant for you because you are God's loving child if you will believe in Him. But if, the Spirit, but if by the Spirit you put to death the actions of the body, you will live. All who are led by God's Spirit are God's sons and daughters. You didn't receive a spirit of slavery to lead you back into fear, but you received a spirit that shows you are adopted as His children. What a concept. With this Spirit we cry, Abba, Father. Common words for Dad. I love you, Dad. Because I can call him dad. Someone who doesn't know him intimately like I can, like I am, cannot call him dad. But I can call him dad because the spirit lives in me. The same spirit, verse 16, that agree, the same spirit agrees with our spirit that we are God's children. 
He's our advocate to the Father, stating the case, these children belong to you. Verse 17, but if we are children, then we're also heirs. Wow. We are God's heirs and fellow heirs with Christ. If we really suffer with Him so that we can also be glorified with Him. God is the potter. You and I are the clay. We need to be molded. We need to be pliable. We need to be made into whatever creation He has in design and intent for us. And then be used. Do you understand this concept? It's not that big a concept. It's a concept that a child can even understand. We saw that from the video. So if you're reading your daily Bible reading, we'll call it DBR. So when I say DBR, you'll say, oh, that's what he means. Daily Bible reading. You should recognize this concept because it's not the first time you've seen it already. There was another prophet called. He said, here I am, send me. Isaiah 29 got this message directly from the Lord. Verse 13, the Lord says, These people come near to me with their mouth and honor me with their lips. They say they're your vessel. They say that you're, they're your creation, whatever you design to be. But I'm going to be used for what intent and purpose I am. I might be a plate, but I'm going to put my own things on it, right? I praise you, Lord. You're in control of all things, just not this or this. They have a form of righteousness, as Paul says. A form of righteousness, but it's not true righteousness. Why? Let's, let's start over. The Lord says, these people come near to me with their mouth and honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. Jesus said, love the Lord your God with all your heart mind, body, soul, strength. If your heart isn't focused, as the song says, where Jesus is everything and nothing else will do, then you need to get on your knees and come to the Father and thank Him and praise Him for every breath He has given you, everything He has given you, the good and the bad, because He's trying to mold you into something beautiful. Their worship of me, not just their thoughts of me, their worship of me is based on merely human rules that they have been taught. We go through the motions rather than having a heart focused on worship. Verse 14, Therefore once more I will astound these people with wonder upon wonder. The wisdom of the wise will perish. The, intelligent of the intelligent, intelligence of the intelligent will vanish. Woe to those who go to great depths to hide their plans from the Lord, who do their work in darkness and think, who sees us? Who will know? You turn things upside down. Not what we planned at all. Who would ever think God would send His only Son to die? The King of all kings and Lord of all lords, humbly laying down His life, silent as a lamb before His shearers, because He loved you and I. He didn't call a legion of angels to come take away the pain and suffering or anything else. Even when God Himself turned His back on His Son. Because He had to. Because He was carrying your sin and shame. My sin and shame. Jesus' response was, forgive them, Father. And then He responded, it is finished. The work on the cross is complete. You or I don't have to do anything else but believe Truly believe, not believe that there's a God out there, but believe that there's a God who loved you enough to give His Son's life up for you. And now you'll take up your cross. Well, first there is deny myself, that selfishness. Then I can take up my cross and follow in the footsteps of Jesus, my Savior and my Lord. You turn things upside down. Huh, look at here as if the potter were thought to be like the clay. The potter's in complete control designing his creation. Whether you understand it or not, whether you fight back or not, the potter makes the creation 
throws a lump of clay out, whatever he does, it's all in his hands. Shall what is formed say to the one who formed it, you didn't make me? Can the pot say to the potter, you don't know anything? I don't think so. How are you worshiping? Who are you worshiping? Is your worship merely lip service? Are you worshiping God as the one who gave His only Son to save your life? Are you worshiping Him as one who is molding you and making you into a beautiful creation? Will you let Him mold you, make you? Will you let Him use you? Will you give up your selfish desires to serve the potter? That's not the first, I mean, that's not the only time Isaiah mentions the same concept. Later in Isaiah 45, this is written, I am the Lord, this direct revelation from God, and there is no other, because he sets up who he is first so that we understand that. He is the potter. You and I are the clay. I am the Lord and there is no other. Apart from me, there is no God. I will strengthen you. Wow, that he would do that for me. Though you have not even acknowledged me. So that from the rising of the sun to the place of its setting, people may know there is none besides me. Even Pharaoh's observers, his, his people that came to him to give him advice, said as the, the, these plagues were coming along, why don't you acknowledge this God? <laughs> But see, Pharaoh had hardened his heart, so then God hardened Pharaoh's heart. There was no turning back. Because he fought with the potter so much, God molded him into what God molded him into. Wow. I don't want to fight with the potter. I want him to mold me and make me into what he wants me to be. He has plans and purposes for me, and they are for me to prosper and to do well to give me hope, peace, and security that Jesus builds upon that and says that it surpasses all of your understanding. You can't even, comp even fathom the riches that God has in store for you. So I want to let Him make me into whatever He wants to make me into and use me however He wants to use me, even when it hurts. So that people may know there is none besides me. I am the Lord and there is no other. I form the light and create the darkness. I bring prosperity and I create disaster. I, the Lord, do all these things. You heavens above, rain down my righteousness. Let the clouds shower it down. Let the earth open wide. Let salvation spring up. Let righteousness flourish with it. I, the Lord, have created it. Verse 9. Woe to those who quarrel with their maker. Those who are nothing but pot sheards among the pot sheards on the ground. Broken pots lying in the dump. Because the potter sides he doesn't want to use them anymore. They're worthless to him. Does the clay say to the potter, what are you making? Does your work say the potter has no hands? Or does the work say form me, mold me, make me? Whatever your will be done, Lord, not mine but yours. Are you quarreling with the potter? Or are you letting him work with you? Need you, make you, do whatever. Isaiah wrote again in Isaiah 64, he wrote a recognition back to the Lord. This is not a revelation from the Lord. This is Isaiah's words back to him. He says, Since ancient times no one has heard, no ear has perceived, no eye has seen any God besides you. If you really look, every other thing that I put my faith and my hope in are meaningless. They are created things from the Creator, including myself. A God who acts on behalf of those who wait for Him, who let Him make them into what He wants them to be. Verse 5, You come to the help of those who gladly do right and remember your, who remember your ways. 
But when we continue to sin against them, you are angry. How can they be saved? All of us have become like one who is unclean, and all our righteousness, however much you think you have, are like filthy rags. We all shrivel up like a leaf, and, the, and like the wind, our sins sweep us away. Where do they sweep us to? Eternal death. All have sinned and all fall short of God's glorious standard. And the wages of sin is eternal death. There's a but. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. It doesn't have to be that way. Because God loved us so much that He sent His Son. He provided a way. Even in the time when everything seemed the darkest. At just the right moment God sent His Son to die for us. Did Israel... Receive him? Did they recognize him? No, because they didn't come again as the way my self-centered heart wanted to see this king. I wanted to be set free from my burdens and pain. I didn't want to take up a cross, an instrument of suffering and persecution, and follow after this king who didn't have a place to lay his head. But that's God's plan because he's molding me and making me into a beautiful masterpiece with his own hands. He is lovingly crafting me. Verse 7, No one calls on your name or strives to lay hold of you. For you have hidden your face from us and have given us over to our sins. See, that happens if we don't turn. Yet, that's the same as a but, if you don't understand that. Yet, you, Lord, are our Father. You are faithful. So let me recognize this. Let, let me let you understand this, Isaiah says. We are the clay. You are the potter. I'll do whatever you tell me to do. Do you think it was easy? Legend has it that Isaiah was sown in half. He literally was cut in half because he was a messenger of God that brought a message that the people didn't like to hear. Those who called themselves God's children, who honored Him with their lips, but their hearts were far from Him. He goes on to finish that verse saying, We are all the work of your hands. You are the clay, He is the potter. Does the clay have any right to say anything up to the Father other than mold me, make me, use me? For we are His creation. Created anew in Christ Jesus on top of that. Wow! That we can be free from sin and the penalty of sin. That we can have eternal life with Jesus Christ our Lord. And nothing can ever separate us from Him. So then we get to the book of Jeremiah. Rose read that this morning. Jeremiah is told that if he goes to the potter's house, he'll be given a vision. And if you read on in verse 5 through 9, 10, whatever it is... You'll see that God says, Can I do this with Israel just like this potter's doing here? Can I mold them or make them into whatever I want? Can I do that with any nation, any king, any people, any person? Don't I have the right to? But I challenge you a second and go home and read it. Jeremiah chapter 18. Was the message, verses 5 through 9 or 10, whatever it was, or was the message what Jeremiah saw? Creation screams out. All of our circumstances tell us there's a God who's in complete control, whether we want to think that He is or not. Sovereignly, all of heaven that we don't have any comprehension of is watching in great expectation of what God is going to do with these human beings that He is lavishly pouring His love out on creating them. When Jeremiah got to the potter's house, the house the potter owned, and all the clay inside of it and all the created things that were already in the house, they belonged to who? The potter. Right? And Jeremiah saw the potter crafting, and he probably watched like the little boy did. What's he going to do? Wait a minute. What's he going to do with that piece? It's messed up. I'm messed up. What's, what could he ever do with me? How could he use me? And then the potter starts lovingly crafting. Wait a minute. Does he lovingly craft or does he smash it back down and do like this? And add more water, drenching it, whatever he does. 
Maybe you don't know much about pottery. But the first thing is the potter smacks that clay down onto the turntable. He spins it as fast or slow as he wants to. He adds water, doesn't add water, and then he starts kneading and kind of like dough and stuff and making it and whatever. The process at first is pretty rough. But then as it gets along and the, the clay gets balanced on the wheel, <laughs> it, our lives centered in Christ, <laughs> our balance point, then you can start molding and making the clay quits fighting as much and it starts making this beautiful masterpiece. And no matter wherever it gets marred, no matter what happens to you, no matter what mud or pit you fall into, all you have to do is recognize the potter and he'll start creating you anew. It is his will to mold you into a masterpiece, into the image of his son. That's kind of what the process is. So I'm thinking as I'm reading this, I'm sitting here saying, you know, that message had to speak to Jeremiah. Had to speak to him for the people. Had to speak to him personally as he watched that potter. Then he got the message and God said, don't I have a right to do with whatever I want to do, whatever with? I'm the creator of all things. If I want to say I turn my back on my people and I'm going to throw them in the dump where their bodies are laying around and the animals are eating their bodies, then I have a right to do that. But let me tell you this, that was never God's intent. It was never His intent, even the thieves on the cross, for one of them to ridicule Jesus, but the other to accept Him. It was His will that both of those men would accept Jesus Christ. But see, we, got, we have our own, we're the only created being in our realm of things that we understand that has the right to talk back to the potter. Are you talking back to the potter or are you letting him mold and make you? Jeremiah was told to go to the potter's house and he would get a message. Do you know the potter. Are you his creation? I got another video that'll tell you a little bit more about this process. Kind of simple, but as we see this, maybe it'll help you think.
out the quality of clay and to expand what they have, they mix the quality of clay with the crusty, lumpy, hard stuff that they don't really like. And they mix it and they wrap it all tight together so they're all in a piece together and bury it for a year. And then they come out and then they've got a big lump of quality clay because it's all combined together. So that way they have more than what they started with. That was always my favorite part was how they made the clay. So I don't know what you picked up from it, and thank you for adding that part to it. But you're on the turntable, period. Is Christ the center? Because unless you're centered in Christ, you're not going to turn out to be the masterpiece that the potter has in plan. And He's going to continue, as you saw from the video, having His hands on you, never taking His eyes off of you. That God would love me that much. Romans 8 is what I read from you earlier in the Common English Bible. That's the life in the Spirit chapter that tells us it's not about us. It's about the life we have with God who lives in us now. Because that's how we're a new creation centered in Christ. That we're born again. And as we read and study God's Word and use the gifts that the Spirit gives us, that we spur one another along and we love one another and don't keep records of wrongs and, and we build each other up to become the body of Christ literally as body parts do, then we are functioning more and more. We are becoming more and more that masterpiece. So then in chapter 11, at the end of chapter 11, and you'll see the similarity here as in Isaiah wrote and stuff, you'll get this doxology praising God. And then you get a couple verses that you hear repeated a lot. People talk about them, but they, they really do them or they lip service. So at the end of chapter 11, and remember this is a flowing letter that Paul wrote. He writes, Oh, the depth of the riches of the wisdom and knowledge of God, the potter. How unsearchable his judgments and his past beyond tracing out. Think of Job and how he continued to say this, even though oh, man was the potter working on that clay. Verse 34, who has known the mind of the Lord? Or who has been his counselor? Who can put a hook in the Leviathan? Which we don't even know what that is. Verse 35, who has ever given to God that God should repay them? For from him and through him and for him are all things. To Him be the glory forever. Amen. And it continues to read, Therefore, because of who God is and what He's done for you, because He's the potter and you're the clay, because His ways are so much higher than yours, because He is a faithful and just God, because He's full of mercy and love and grace, but also has to judge sin, because of all these things, therefore I urge you, I beg you, I plead with you, brothers and sisters, Christians, the church, put your name in there. I beg you, I urge you, Alan, in view of God's mercy. He gave me mercy. What I did not deserve, I deserved eternal death. I deserve to be thrown into the dump and have beasts of the field feasting off of my flesh. But I don't. <laughs> I have eternal life through Jesus Christ. Because in view of God's mercy, I urge you to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice. Now wait a minute, that doesn't sound pleasing again. Sacrifices have to put, be put on the altar. In this case, we have to willingly be put on the turntable of the potter or the altar we have to let Him mold and make us. In a case of a sacrifice, we have to lay there and be burned up and be used, bringing a sweet aroma, a fragrance to God, a sacrifice pleasing to Him. I urge you, because of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice. This is holy and pleasing to God. It is your true and proper worship. Isaiah said, these people worship me with their mouths. 
They might even worship me with their actions, checking off the boxes that they've done, but their hearts are far from me. Because if my heart is like Jesus, I'll willingly give up my life. I'll take up my cross. I'll put myself on that turntable. I'll let the potter do whatever he wants to do with me. Verse 2. Here's how you do this. Do not conform to the pattern of this world. That's what's wrong with the church in this country today. They become worldly. They've changed God's word for a lie because it's pleasing and we don't want to offend anybody. They've traded the truth for a lie, watered it down. Let's just preach Jesus' love. Let's don't preach that God condemns sin and He will judge sin. And He will discard sin. But He won't discard the sinner who humbles himself before Him and says... I want Jesus in the center of my life. You will never, ever be discarded. And then you'll be being molded and made by the potter with his eyes constantly on you, his hands constantly on you, molding you and making you no matter what happens during the process so that you are a wonderful creation of his. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed. Change like a caterpillar is changed into a butterfly. <laughs> wow, look what it was before. Who would have ever thought that's what that word is? Metamorphosis. Who would have ever thought that God could use someone like me to become a good and faithful servant that he says, well done, come into the Father's house. Let's celebrate together. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is. Not my will, not my self-centered, selfish will, but His will. His good, pleasing, and perfect will for His clay. I urge you to let God transform you. To let the potter create the clay as He sees fit. Father in heaven, we do thank you and praise you. We thank you that... Your words, if we just listen from a childlike perspective, can ring such clarity. We thank you that you are willing to create something beautiful from such a mess as we are. We thank you that you would give your son to die for us. Lord, I pray that each one here centers their life on Jesus Christ and nothing else. That we let you form and make us that your will be done, that your kingdom come. May you continue to forgive us as we forgive others. May you feed us what we need, and may we not be selfishly desiring more, but to desire the Creator over the creations, to focus our heart, our mind, our body, and soul on you, and to love others as Christ loved and gave himself. Thank you for this church, Lord. Thank you for the freedom that we have to come and worship you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.